Greetings and salutations all across the fruited plain. Glad you uh, decided to find some interest in this particular session as we take a look at all the postseason tournaments in men's and women's college basketball across the course of the next half a month or so. And we will get to the big dance a little bit later. We take a look first at the collegeinsider.com postseason tournament, the CIT featuring this year only a field of 26 teams, and that uh, compared to 32 in seasons past. And a big part of it is the additional two teams, courtesy of the coach John McClendon Classic, and it will be a televised game on Monday, March the 14th on CBS Sports Network. That is traditionally a regular season feature, fixture, excuse me, that features typically at least one historically black college or university. And I think that it's a decent idea. And as far as what's going to happen in the future, if it becomes part of the CIT in particular full time, I'd be welcome to it because then it's more than just a random game in the middle of the season to make a spectacle of instead of making it a meaningful game where both teams will have some sort of incentive to want to win. Um, but at the same time, CIT doesn't have as much history, which would make it good in which case, but it, if it's a first round game or just a part of any kind of tournament, it doesn't make sense. It would have to be its own standalone event and that's pretty much what having it during the regular season would be. So you have both sides to it. I'm not for or against it. Uh, whatever happens that the deciding party see fit is fine with me. Going forward, there are two games on that Monday, one of which is the McClendon Classic, as I mentioned, and then three games on Tuesday, Wednesday the 16th sees the remainder of the contests. The fixtures in the second round will be held between March 17th and 20th. Quarterfinals the 22nd to 24. Semifinals on the 27th with the big game on the 29th at the end of the month to round out March in this particular contest. The way that I figured this would have to work because GCU is... I imagine with this particular fixture being included, the McClendon Classic, they would have to not be one of the first four in, assuming that they won their first round game, or even if it was South Carolina St State, to potentially win whichever team does happen to win this fixture. It does appear that um, one of them will have to drop out. And the reason I started to say about GCU was the premise that they have the best record of this field. So if they do eventually go on to win against SC State, they would be the top overall seed. But because there are less than 32 teams, it would create an uneven bracket. And you'd have to figure out four teams to sit, in which case, because this is a special quote-unquote fixture, and by title only really having it moved to this tournament, I would have them first one out as opposed to first one in. And then whoever was would have been first one out then becomes the last one in, in which case Texas A&M Corpus Christi becomes the number one. Columbus moves up from four to three. UL Monroe goes from five to four, and then GCU would be the first out. Like I mentioned, they would play... Um, Central Michigan through my picks, so that would make the most sense. And by the time all is said and done, uh, Army and Fairfield it got crossed out originally because I thought that we might need to reorganize how that was done, but then I decided to stick with the original sheet of paper that I was actually correct in my original assessment as to how the tournament would potentially go. So Army and Fairfield being the remaining two seeds of the final four that played each other that won. That would be also part of the quarter uh, second round, rather, to become part of the semifinal. So Fairfield, I had defeating Army there, playing the best remaining seed, which had the bye. That was GCU, in my opinion, based on ranking individually as far as their record is concerned, and then Texas A&M over Fairfield after all said and done. So there's the CIT in a nutshell. That was a little bit uh, out of the ordinary, uh, but you look at the CBI, 
a lot smaller field as has traditionally been. They've never fielded more than 16, which is an appropriate number given how bracketology generally works. Um, this is another interesting competition given that the final four are reseeded. And you saw that uh, I kind of forgot about that. So that's what the green ink you see uh, at the bottom there is for as far as hosts are concerned and making sure that I had the right teams facing the appropriate corresponding teams. Uh, but nothing remained really unchanged. And Ohio and Siena there, as you see at the final, which was originally my semifinal before I made the appropriate corrections, uh, I felt that it was going to be tough and that either team could win at home or on the road against each other. And it helps that when you're in this area of the United States that you get to see a lot of these teams more often because you think about the University of Buffalo, St. Bonaventure, uh, Canisius, Niagara, these four teams, three of them play in one of those two conferences with Ohio or Siena, depending on which one we're talking about. So that kind of helps to know what kind of teams they might have. That's not to say there isn't other uh, teams that I may or may not be familiar with, but Siena over the years has had a traditionally strong program in Ohio, much the same in their respective conferences. It's just a matter of how they did out of conference that kind of can dictate where I might lean with a certain team when I'm making these predictions year in and year out. So Moorhead State, is a team that has also made its way to the big dance here and there, not terribly often, but they've done so before. So, and, and most of this field, I believe, has done so at some point as well. So uh, certainly all capable teams, not that this year with the stronger selection than years previously in recent years, in my opinion, although I don't think that the hype is necessarily there this year, which probably is appropriately so. Um, but Duquesne, their men's program has been up and down year to year, and they came in with uh, St. Bonaventure to kind of figure out what they're going to do. They've been both in the A-10 and out of the A-10, so it's, it's, it's interesting to see how things have managed with Duquesne. The reason I say that is because about the same time that St. Bonaventure started to get back, Duquesne tried to do it, and then they didn't, and then they did again. It just it, Duquesne's men's program is just very interesting to me. Uh, Ohio and Albany, Great Danes at Albany, just they, they have a lot of different mentalities that somehow manage to compete together fairly well. I don't know if that's going to be enough to beat Ohio, as you can see there, but uh, the only obvious winner to me probably had to be Idaho over Seattle. Other than that, I think, and, and, and perhaps Mont over Western Carolina it would be a close second, but other than that, the remaining six contests, I think, would be relatively even keeled. And the way that I had it would have been different because if Vermont plays Ohio, I think Vermont wins, as you see at the bottom there before the changes. So a lot of different things coming in here, and Pepperdine, uh, I'd like to see them as strong as they were when they played uh, NC State in 83 uh, in the big tournament, but didn't happen. So, or rather hasn't happened since. But Sienna, the winner in the CBI, let's go towards the WNIT. And this one's usually the least entertaining of all just because of the amount of competition that's there. This one's, oh, this one's an okay tournament uh, this year. Um, and the reason I say that is because even though the regular women's tournament is usually not the greatest, it's still trumps the WNIT in some capacity, but this year we have some solid competition. Um, even outside of the final, my final four, uh, Akron has had a decent team compared to years past, though they're 
in recent years, their team has gotten stronger. Quinnipiac's usually a presence in some capacity, and more often than not, they've made the big dance since making the jump up from Division Two when they were in the Northeast 8, as it was then called. Now the Northeast 10 in Division 2, which features a lot of teams. Um, and it's it, it was a very competitive conference uh, at the D Division 2 level then and still is relatively now. Um, Georgia Tech, I'm looking at in the uh, bottom right of your screen, VCU, FGCU. That's, the, you know, they're, they're all decent looking squads there. Charlotte, I'd say. Uh, Harvard, Rutgers. That, that entire group of programs, I wouldn't hesitate to win an additional game than what I've given them. Tulane, traditionally strong. Not as strong as in years past, in my opinion. So I'll, I'll go with it. Got Tech in that regard, but Temple, this is a, an, another team that when they used to be in the A-10, every year it seemed like they would win or at least make it to the final and still make it into one of the two tournaments. Going back to the left side, Minnesota, outside of Maryland, their other losses were at least somewhat respectable, depending on which one in particular we're talking about. St. Louis, Ball State, these are programs that probably don't deserve to play each other that early. Memphis, probably the first time I think that they've had a more than decent team since 2006's men's tournament, because they, they were pretty well that, that season, from my recollection. You and I, the men's team, could do well in the big tournament, but this one, it, it's possible that they can get at least third round, if not further, assuming that all the cards fall their way. Gonzaga, they probably have a decent shot at beating Oregon, even though I have the Ducks winning there. St. Mary's, just... Whatever they do, the men's team does, and whatever the men's team does, they do as far as success. Uh, recently, probably dating back to 2008 or so, Arkansas State, they've, you know, so far in the few years since the rebranding to the Red Wolves, this probably uh, is a good start. If uh, they make it to the third round, as I have them here, so there's a lot of good uh, good chances for upsets on my bracket as far as who I've picked. Not that there be they'd be upsets in the actual matchups. That's assuming that most everything goes according to plan. Let's take a look at the actual national invitational tournament. Bonaventure, one of the big snubs of the big dance. Decent shot to go all the way. Again, St. Mary's' program, another one that was out there. Akron, I think, also could have been in there, though. You know, if they're sixth based in just in their portion of the bracket, and Monmouth is the number one, I, I do think that they can beat Monmouth, but whichever team wins that game... I wouldn't doubt that they could beat Houston or SDSU based on my bracket, but uh, it's it, it, that one's probably going to be a, a blind draw for for that half of the bracket. Whoever wins that particular game, assuming those two, and that's not to say that uh, Florida couldn't give Monmouth a run if they wind up beating Akron or Ohio State, but Davidson beat Bana in the. A-10 tournament. Imagine if they made it that far to the left half of the bracket final, and that and that would be at MSG. So that means that it would be a closer game slightly to, to Bana, but that's not a place that Bana goes too often as far, as far as New York in general is concerned, given their conference, but... Eh, 
either way, it would certainly make for an interesting storyline. Nothing too extravagant elsewise to talk about. I, Valpo and and Texas Southern. Texas Southern, I think, if they beat Valpo, can turn a few heads, but that's... Valpo, it'll be interesting only because of the way that the acoustics in their gymnasium are and how it affects how people communicate in that building. Drexel's kind of the same way, in my opinion, but no matter... There's a lot more still that we got to get to, and that includes the women's final four from Indianapolis, Indiana. UConn, the typical name that everybody throws out here, probably the big surprise on my bracket, according to most of you, given that they're undefeated. Um, but Baylor's the number one, Notre Dame's the number one, South Carolina's the number one. And Maryland looming in a number two, not too far away from the top four, as people might expect. Others that are there that could also be mentioned. Uh, Texas, who I happen to have winning. Would they have beaten UConn if they got there? I do think so. Uh, but, again, the, the idea of me picking Duquesne over UConn, not because I'm familiar with the conference or the team as well, and I know them, not that... <sighs> See, I, I always struggle with UConn every year when they do so well. Are they vulnerable? I've seen weaknesses in them, not very many, but weaknesses that I think Duquesne has improved on over the course of this particular season. But... It after they beat UConn, it's not like they can win more than one game just because it's UConn and that requires a lot of physical and mental exertion. And to go up against a team like Michigan State, for instance, they're a team that kind of... They slyly manage to beat you. They often use their head and are able to think about everything three times before the next play. So it's it, it, it's just interesting to watch Michigan State's women's team play uh, regardless of the season because even if they're not the best team, they are a very good mental team. And that you don't see too too often. Uh, but, and, and though UND has a similar kind of mentality, it, most of it's in Muffet McGraw and what she puts up on, on the uh, whiteboard during timeouts. It's, 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 it's uncanny, some, some of these persons' abilities to just be steps ahead. Baylor... I thought about picking them over Texas. I, I really did, but Texas, for whatever reason, is sticking out in my mind that this team's going to win from what I've seen out of them this year. And you really want to think that it's going to be Baylor, UConn, or South Carolina, or Notre Dame. You really want it to be one of the number one seeds, but I really can't see more than one at any point in the tournament, whether my bracket is nearly correct or not correct at all, I still can't see m more than two, probably m more than one, making it to the final four. I make a case for Maryland every year, still hasn't happened, and I'm picking Maryland on the premise of it's got to end sometime with Notre Dame. So... That one is probably the biggest blind draw of all the games in the field, the way I've chosen it. Buffalo's an interesting case. I think that if they do fall to West Virginia, West Virginia could beat Arizona State. I'm not going to go so far as that. Even if they did win, I would stick with Arizona State as my Elite Eight qualifier. Stanford has a chance to do some damage against North Dakota, but at the same time, Stanford can also beat Maryland, um, though I wouldn't change my pick right away 
I'd have to put a lot more thought into that. Texas A&M could beat Florida State, but after that, they won't get passed. If Baylor didn't play there, I think Texas A&M could have uh, made it so far as at least the Elite Eight, if not the Final Four, given that Bonaventure was their opponent. But Bona, will they go as far? I, I want to say no. But their opponents in that 16th of the bracket, or sorry, that 8th of the bracket, I, outside of Baylor, I'm, I'm not so sure. I, I, I do think that there's a possibility for them. But even then, again, a lot of things um, need to go right off the court, I think, for them as well. As if they're mentally focused, which they have tended to drift off just a little bit. But uh, if they can play like they did the one particular game in Dayton this past season, they've, they've got a shot to go as far as I have them to, if not further. So, but Army, I think, is the story of the season at 29-2. and two. This is the team that everybody will want to root for, of the non-typical number one slash number two seeds. This is the team, even though it's not a Cinderella per se, it's a feel-good story. And a lot of people, myself included, are feel-good stories, but at the same time, you try to be realistic, and I may not be the most realistic with this particular bracket, but I'm happy with it as it stands. Finally, the big one. Final four in Houston, April 2nd and 4th. April 4th, you see Baylor over Xavier. Been a long time since Xavier has been that far in the tournament. This might not be the year, but... They have an opportunity to get a lot of favorable games to play. That's probably based on what I'm looking at. The easiest of the four quads is the East in Philadelphia. Uh, one of the big things outside of the snubs that we've already talked about, the way I see it, that Nova should not be a number one, and they're not. Again, my opinion. But certainly not a schmuck team, as some might call them. But Nova, they're not the same Nova of recent years that have been as qualified to be a number one or number two. But I don't know, given UNC, given Virginia, given Oregon, given Kansas, they might replace Virginia. Certainly not UNC. If I had Nova anywhere, that is where I would put them. Uh, they would have an easier time with Hampton than Virginia will. I thought about putting Hampton, not because and we've seen how close we've come to having a 16 finally beat a number one, but of the 16 seeds, if FGU is placed there instead, FGU probably beats Virginia or Nova. However, that's not the case, and a lot of people don't pick the, the play-in games. I have, because to me, that can be the difference between who wins or who would potentially lose a number one or a number six matchup. And I don't like the idea of an 11 play-in, but seeing as that's what's given to us, you deal with it. Because if, if you're going to have an 11 matchup, at least include those teams as a part of the normal field and then have your traditional, um, well, whoever is 15 or 16, make those be the play-in games for Pete's sake. Uh, but you deal with it. I'll go 
Tulsa over Michigan, even though that was probably the spot that would have went to Bonaventure. And that the argument there was that Tulsa had more top 50 wins, which means that Bona had the lesser strength of schedule compared to them. I can see the argument. And I do think that Michigan would have lost to either team. And on that premise, I go with Tulsa, but West Virginia, despite their loss in, in, in the Big 12 tournament, I'll give them an additional win. So Stephen F. Austin and then Tulsa, but Stephen F. Austin could win that game in which that would be a, an entertaining game, Tulsa and SF Austin. Probably edge to Tulsa there, but it wouldn't surprise me either way. Uh, Wisconsin over Pitt is a particularly eye-catching game for me. I'll still go with Wisconsin, but whoever wins there, Pitt could upset Xavier if they wound up getting that far. I see it. I don't know that it will happen, but they're, they're, for them in particular, there's a window. But if it's Wisconsin, they're, they're through. Like I said, Virginia, if, if I'm having difficulty with them in Hampton, certainly they can't get past Texas Tech or Butler, in which case Butler would be my pick between those two, but and by those two referring to Texas Tech. ULAR, you got to put one in there. That would probably be the closest one, or at least one of the two that I had in mind. Iowa State and Dayton at the Midwest Final you want to kind of give it to Dayton on a few different remedies, but Iowa State certainly won't win, I don't think, not with a first-year coach. If this were Fred Hoiberg's team, I might get them past Xavier and not past Baylor or Maryland, but, and, and come, come to think of Maryland, look at all the attention they've got. First big ranking since Gary Williams' 2003 championship winning team. You know, this is with the highest preseason ranking they had coming in. I, 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 I want to see ISU do well with, with their new head of staff, but I don't think it'll happen anytime soon, at least. Going towards the other half of the bracket. Well, actually, let's go back to the east for a moment, because I overlooked uh, Chatty and Stony Brook. If Chattanooga wins, I think Providence can get past Xavier. That that would have been an oversight, if anything, when we get to that part of the tournament. But now back to the South and West. I mentioned Baylor is my winner, but Cincy or Oregon would make a good test out of it. If Cincy wins, I might give it to VCU in the Final Four, and that would probably make Xavier my champion over Maryland, uh, in which regard. But Texas A&M, a, a quality side, VCU's shown us that when they get to the tournament, they're good for three or four games. So I'll stick with history for the short term. We'll see what happens for next year if they even make it. Um same thing with Oklahoma. If VCU weren't proven that they can last a few rounds in this tournament in the recent years, then I'll, I'm going to go with VCU. There, there's there's no reason not to it based on that. Buffalo, this is not certainly not a homer pick, and it's tough when you've gone through three coaches in the span of four, five years, and it would have been nice to see Reggie Witherspoon make it. But with the subtraction of head coach by Bobby Hurley going to Arizona State, it's tough. But they're they're there, so they got to make the most of it. That does it for me. So I'm not going to turn back on anything at this point. I feel uh, that some of the flip-flops that I was considering uh, will stay as is. So tell, tell me what uh, you think is going to happen below. I'm not going to comment back just so that uh, nothing 
bad may happen. I mean, I'm I'm good natured, but at the same time, I don't know who the the audience and how they're going to react. So, have fun with March Madness, and we'll hopefully see you next year.